It's really hard. And it is imposing real pain on a lot of Canadians and Canadian families. This is Canada, a nation blessed with abundant natural resources and strong sectors like oil, real estate and finance. This is the Canada we've come to know. However, as we step onto its soil, the landscape appears bleak. Housing prices have soared beyond reach, securing a loan feels like an uphill battle, and they face ongoing crises such as the opioid overdose epidemic. In a recent projection by the OECD, a shadow of gloom looms over Canada's future. It suggests that the nation's economy will lag behind other countries in growth for the next three decades. This announcement carries dire implications for Canada as its economic stability teeters on the edge of collapse. So stay tuned as today we dive deeper into the downward spiral of Canada's economy. If someone were to inquire about the primary issue facing Canada's economy, the straightforward response would be productivity. Canada is an immense country, ranking as the second largest sovereign state globally in terms of land area yet it boasts a relatively modest population of 40 million people, just a bit more than California. From its early days of colonization, first by the French and later by the British, Canada has relied on its resource-based economy. It started with fur, then transitioned to logging and fishing, and by the 20th century, Canada had become a major player in the global export of oil and hydroelectricity. Alberta's oil fields and Quebec's massive hydro dams fueled the nation's prosperity. Certainly, Canada had other industries as well, factories in its cities, financial institutions, advertising agencies, and more. Yet the beating heart of its economy has consistently been its abundant resources. Importantly, Canada has often lived in the towering economic shadow of the United States. Many factories were simply branches of American corporations like Ford, General Motors, Heinz, Kraft and Campbell Soup. But today, Canada faces a grave economic challenge. Canadians find themselves becoming progressively less prosperous, both in comparison to other nations and in absolute terms. A recent forecast by the OECD predicts that over the next three decades, Canada will experience the slowest economic growth among its OECD counterparts. A generation ago, Canada was among the leaders of the world's prosperous nations. But a generation from now, it's projected to slip toward the bottom. At the heart of this issue lies the problem of productivity. Canada's growth engine appears to be stalled. So why is this happening? In simplest terms, it's because, over the past few decades, Canadians have stopped making things and have instead refocused their economy on buying and selling houses. Canada transformed itself from a resource economy into a Ponzi scheme where people buy and sell homes for increasingly large sums of money. It all began in the global financial crisis of 2008 and 2009. Canada didn't actually have a financial crisis at that time. Its housing market didn't burst out like the US and British housing markets did. Its banks were sound and didn't need bailouts. But when the world's central banks started to drop interest rates to stimulate their economies, Canada's central bank, the Bank of Canada, did the same. It dropped rates to nearly zero. Suddenly, mortgages were extremely cheap to borrow. House prices in Canada began rising dramatically. At that time, 70% of Canadians owned their own homes, and all those people started feeling richer. They also felt invincible. They saw the US housing market go bust, but nothing had happened in Canada, and that gave Canadians a sense of immunity from the crisis. With this sense of newfound wealth and invincibility, Canadians began speculating on the housing market. House prices in major centres like Toronto and Vancouver grew by double-digit percentages every year. It looked like the beginning of a massive housing bubble, except that bubble never burst. Then, in 2014, the next phase of Canada's decline began. Global oil prices collapsed, falling by half in the space of a year. Oil was Canada's biggest, most lucrative export. But with the crash, investment in the oil industry began to shrink. Businesses and the government turned their back on oil, and everyone focused even more on buying and selling houses. Also, with a significant influx of immigrants, the demand for housing surged diverting funds away from business investments and into the construction of homes. 
Canadian households shifted their wealth from stock markets to property purchases, leaving fewer resources available for new business ventures. This imbalance had a notable impact on Canada's economic growth. The limited investment stifled the creation of new businesses, and the few that did emerge often fell into the hands of American firms. Compared to the United States, Canada's per-worker investment lagged, leading to hindered productivity. Outdated equipment and fewer resources resulted in lower production levels, causing Canada to slip behind. Furthermore, housing costs skyrocketed, tripling since 2010, even as wages remained stagnant. While this proved beneficial for existing homeowners, it posed a formidable challenge for young individuals aspiring to enter the housing market. Unfortunately, this intricate economic scenario continues to shape Canada's future. Moreover, the situation has worsened considerably since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. During the pandemic, the Bank of Canada once again lowered interest rates to zero. Canadians rushed to borrow money to buy homes at an unprecedented pace. Between 2020 and 2022, house prices in Canada surged by a whopping 50%. Inflation soon followed, prompting the Bank of Canada, like other central banks worldwide, to raise interest rates. This had a significant impact on Canada's housing market. Unlike the US, where you can secure a mortgage rate for 30 years, Canadian mortgages typically last for five years and then need to be renewed at a new rate. You have the choice between a fixed rate for those five years or a variable rate that fluctuates with the economy. During the pandemic, variable rates were lower than fixed ones, so many opted for them. Approximately a third of Canadians have variable rate mortgages, which can go up or down every month. When the Bank of Canada increased rates, a third of Canadian mortgages instantly became more expensive. Additionally, the remaining fixed rate mortgages are set to expire within five years, compelling those borrowers to refinance at significantly higher rates. This put immense pressure on Canadian consumers, causing widespread anxiety. To avert a housing collapse akin to the one in the US, Canada's banks devised an inventive solution. They extended the mortgage terms, reducing monthly payments but drastically extending the time it takes to pay off the loan. Because the borrowing amounts are so substantial, many Canadians now have mortgages that last 70, 80 or even 90 years. This isn't a joke, it's the reality today. Home ownership has turned into a near perpetual burden. All of this turmoil was triggered by the rise in interest rates. Meanwhile, first-time buyers find it nearly impossible to afford homes due to exorbitant prices and high interest rates. While people are still buying homes, most existing homeowners are using their wealth to acquire additional properties. Corporations are also entering the market, frequently outbidding families. Recent analysis indicates that given current prices and interest rates, only 10% of Canadians can genuinely afford to own a home. In addition to the housing bubble, several other factors are casting a shadow over the Canadian economy. Firstly, internal Canadian politics have exacerbated the recent discord between Beijing and Ottawa, escalating it into a full-blown exchange of expelled diplomats. Although a few experts monitoring China-Canada relations downplay the dispute, with one describing it as fairly insignificant, it adds to the growing strain that could result in a more hazardous, lasting rupture. Canada being a smaller country compared to the economic giant that is China, may potentially bear significant economic costs due to this ongoing tension. Secondly, Canada confronts a pressing problem, the need to diminish the devastating effects of opioids. In 2020 alone, a staggering 7,328 deaths attributed to the apparent opioid toxicity took place from January to December, averaging about 20 fatalities per day. So there's a long list of additional issues plaguing this country at present, and these problems are typically associated with a nation in turmoil. Addressing these challenges would demand a Herculean effort. It might even necessitate a federal government-backed initiative on the scale of a Marshall Plan, collaborating with private industry to rebuild public housing. Implementing stricter regulations on large corporations with regard to price hikes, real estate acquisitions and tax avoidance would be essential. That's it for today. And now we invite you to share your thoughts in the comments. Do subscribe to the channel if you like our content. We will catch you in the next one.